Welcome everybody to Functional Aging Summit. I'm Lindsay Vastola and I'm thrilled to be here to help host and moderate this upcoming session, Every Foot Tells a Story. If you have not heard Dr. Emily Splickle speak, you are in for a treat and I guarantee that you will become addicted to learning from her and listening to her. Um, and I, I bet if you even want to tell, say in the chat, you know, if you've been following Dr. Emily, um, if maybe you are certified um, with her, or read any of her books, Dr. Emily Splickle, she is a functional podiatrist. She's a human movement specialist. I feel like I'd take the whole 90 seconds to say all of the amazing things. The founder of EFBA Global, um, she created the Barefoot Training Specialist Certification and the inventor of the amazing uh, Nabosu Barefoot Technology, which I use myself and is phenomenal and changing lives. That is just a short snippet. Um, I always learn something from Dr. Emily. There is always, she has this keen ability to take something very complex and simplify it and make you excited to learn about some of the things that you would think you would never be excited to learn about and put, makes it in, uh, is able to communicate it in such an effective way. So I hope you're as excited to hear from Dr. Emily as I am. Um, so welcome, Dr. Emily. Welcome, everybody. I will be moderating, uh, moderating the chat. Um, if we have time, we're here for about an hour. If we have time for Q&A, Dr. Emily, we want to kind of do that at the end if we have time. Um, and I'll come back on um, and moderate that there. But any questions you guys have, any trouble, I'll be moderating the chat um, in the meantime. Dr. Emily, I want you to have every moment that you can to share your wisdom and gold with us. So I will turn it over to you. Everybody enjoy. Thank you, Dr. Emily. Of course, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to everyone who is spending some time with me to learn about our feet. Uh, this picture. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. You cut out there for a moment. Okay. But try not, but I think overall you were good before, so. Okay. Okay. Um, perfect. So I don't know, Zoom is having a mood today. <laughs> I apologize. Aren't we all sometimes? <laughs> so I know. Uh, so uh, this is going to be um, a slightly different perspective on how we can look at feet. I'm going to assume that maybe you're doing some barefoot training with your clients and you're starting to get some sensory stimulation from the feet. Maybe you're mobilizing the feet. So this means that you are actually seeing their feet. So this is going to be a little bit of an exploration on how the foot is telling you a story based off of some of the different alignments, maybe some calluses and some other um, visual aspects that you can see within the feet. And then we'll, of course, tie that back to movement, how it affects movement and balance and stabilization for your clients as well. This is sponsored by Nabosa, which I'll speak about towards the end. Lindsay mentioned it briefly, um, but it's just our sensory product line to optimize the way that your clients are moving. Lindsay also did a uh, very wonderful introduction to me. Thank you so much. So we're just going to jump right into the content. So our goals is to be looking at a few things that you might actually be seeing in your clients and not realize that it's actually connected to the way that they're moving. I've always had that when a patient would come in and have something like this first one, like ingrown toenails, and you're like, Dr. Emily, this is about fitness. Why are we talking about ingrown toenails? There is a reason of why people are getting ingrown toenails, calluses, losing nails, things like this, that is actually based off of how they move. Everything that I speak about ties back to movement. It's you as the detective to determine what is that movement pattern and what is the effect of that movement pattern on the greater uh, optimization or efficiency or injury or performance for your clients. So let's talk about these beautiful ingrown toenails. Oh, maybe you guys have not had breakfast yet, so I'm sorry <laughs> for some of these things. So an ingrown toenail, let's say you have this in the great toe. So it's on the outside and uh, you wanna start asking yourself. Now, if someone has a ingrown toenail, do they have an associated bunion? There is a correlation between ingrowing toenails and bunions because bunions affect the way that you walk. It affects the way that you push off. Instead of pushing through your toe, you kind of go around the toe. And I know it's a little bit hard to visualize. If I'm, 
What do we bring him? Oh my gosh. Um, if you're going around the big toe, you can actually pinch that nail into the skin every time you take a step. That is a big driver of ingrown toenails. There's also something that is, it looks like a bunion, but it's not a bunion. And I'm excited to show you guys this because I get asked it a lot. And it also wants you to inquire a little bit about the footwear that your clients are wearing. And then, like I had said earlier, the way that they're pushing off. So there is something that is called a hallux interphalangeus. And I want you to just look at this picture for a moment. And then I'm going to go forward and I'm going to show you this picture. Okay. So people love to talk about bunions. This is a classic bunion. You can see the deviation at the first MPJ. The first met head is swinging out. The toe is coming this way, making the bump on the side of the foot. We can appreciate that. Now look at that and let's go back to this. Okay. Do you see how there's actually this angulation at the next joint? And that next joint is called a IPJ. If you see this in your clients, this is not a bunion. This is not something that you would use correct toes and toe spacers and do short foot and strengthen the intrinsics. Completely different issue. This is a deviation that is often caused by limited dorsiflexion in the first MPJ. It can be from shoes. It's from inefficient push-off positions, and it is a big driver of ingrowing toenails. So I just want you to appreciate it. One of your takeaways from this lecture is this is not a bunion. It looks like a bunion to typically the patients will think this is a bunion, but it's a little bit deviation. You cannot correct this without surgery. Very different animal than this bunion. Bunions in themselves are also very deforming in the way that someone walks. It has essentially unlocked the foot, destabilized the foot, and it changes the way that they push off. So they roll around that nail. If you could see here, look exactly, I just see an ingrown toenail happening right there. I also see an ingrown toenail easily happening here as well because you're rolling off of the side of that foot. So when you see ingrown toenails or you your client experiences them, look for a biomechanical cause or a movement cause to that nail. Not just saying, oh, they're from pedicures or oh, they're from how you cut your nail or they're from your shoes. Okay, now this push off position is really important. When you push off, when you push off of the side of your big toe, that is referred to as a low gear push off versus going through the toe. A low gear push off is very inefficient and it's unlocked. So it causes many issues up the chain, but it also drives pressure into the side of that big toe. So we want to be thinking about the way that they're moving. Now, let's say you have your client presenting with this and you're wondering, well, how do I start to address this? What is the solution, Dr. Emily? If it is a classic bunion, a bunion, not the interphalangeus, but a classic bunion, you're looking at toe spacers such as correct toes, bunion booty. Um, you can use any toe spacer off of Amazon if you want. You can pull the toe to the side and then start to strengthen the foot through short foot. If you have a limited range of motion in the big toe because of arthritis, that's called hallux rigidus, then my go-to is to use a rocker-based shoe. So something like a Hoka, um, Dansko is rocker-based. You cannot move through the toe if you have arthritis. So you need a solution for that client that allows them to rock through the shoe instead so they can still maintain an optimal gait pattern and still take long strides to then load their fascial system. Uh, if anyone took the pelvic balance with me yesterday, I spoke a lot about the power of long strides. To take a long stride, you need to get dorsiflexion in your big toe. If you don't have dorsiflexion in your big toe, we kind of need to take it out of a shoe so we can keep that movement pattern, okay? Of course, look at wide toe box shoes is really important. And then train for a high gear push off. So centering the toes, teaching them to roll through all MPJs versus deviating out to the side. So that is our first story that's being told within the foot. 
Now let's say we have another story. You're looking at a foot and you see all these different calluses, right? And maybe you've, you've thought, okay, you know, if I just have pumice these calluses and then they won't come back, they're gonna come back <laughs> if you don't take away the pressure. So calluses are caused by pressure, pressure through like a diffuse pressure as you move. So you can see the bottom of this foot. Look at all of these calluses, Achi machi, right? We have one here, we have one here, diffuse one over here. There is always a story behind every single callus. Now a pinched callus, is probably one of the most common that you may see. And a pinched callus is a callus on the inside of the big toe and just on the or the first MPJ. So along there, this is associated with a low gear push off. I can tell if someone has pinched calluses that they're doing a low gear push off and I don't even have to watch them walk. I don't have to do a gait assessment because I know how they're walking, right? And then we understand the effects of a low gear push off or an inefficient push off position. So this pinched callus classically seen on bunions as well. Maybe they have ingrown toenails as well. So they all kind of go together. But that pinched callus, you really want to appreciate that. Now, another callus that you may see is actually right here. It's under the big toe. And it seems like a weird place to have a callus. But anytime you see a callus on the bottom of the toe, kind of at the IPJ, right? We saw an x-ray with where the IPJ is. Hands down, you know, limited first MPJ dorsiflexion. That is what it means. Maybe they have halts limitus. Maybe they halts rigidus. But they are pushing off most likely inefficiently through that big toe. So we wanna to go to the rocker shoe to help them move through their foot to get that long stride and that optimal gait pattern. So this IP callus is what it's called, very classic when someone has limited dorsiflexion first MPJ. So these are some of the questions that we want to be asking ourselves when you see calluses around the big toe and on the hallux. What's that range of motion of the first MPJ? Assess them open chain, assess them closed chain. Do they have a bunion? If they have a bunion, go to what I mentioned earlier, toe spacers, correct toes, to bunion booty, get them centered so then we can move through this foot in a more optimal pattern. Similar to the other one, right? Oh my gosh, we're going to see very similar uh, ways to address these different conditions. Use those toe spacers, get them in a rocker if they have limited dorsiflexion, and then train them for a high gear push off. Really important to understand that. Now, we don't just get calluses on the big toe, the hallux, the IPJ, and the uh, pinched calluses. You can also get them under the second. So if I look at a foot and I see that they have a callus under the second, just like here, my mind is going to go straight to, I bet they have a long second digit. And a long second digit is called a Morton's toe. So a long second digit, what happens, I believe, yes, perfect. So a long second digit, you can see how this toe is longer. What happens is that we often fit our What happens is we often fit our shoes to the first, and then your second happens to kind of contract in when you wear your shoes. What happens when you do that to your toes in your shoes is you cause what's called retrograde pressure. So the pressure goes up straight down and into the bottom. And then we're getting this callus. This is a hot spot, a pressure spot because of the contracture, the hammer toe, because the toe is too long in the shoe pushes it in like this, hot spot underneath here, okay? Now, it's not just a aesthetic thing. These can be really painful for the clients when they're bearing weight with a hot spot under the second. And then also what starts to happen, whoop, also what starts to happen is that you start to stress the tissue on the bottom. Now, there is a ligament on the bottom of the toe called a plantar plate. And the plantar plate is actually part of your plantar fascia coming across the bottom of the foot and inserting onto the base of the toe. 
when you have hammer toes, especially just your second, you start to stress that ligament plantar fascia plantar plate and you can tear it. And then what happens is the, the toe floats up and now your toe is not even touching the ground. What happens when your toe doesn't even touch the ground? Don't even think about aesthetics. You lose your stability. A really important part on how we maintain balance when we stand on our feet is that your toes have to be contacting the ground. It's called toe purchase. When your clients lose toe purchase, they've just lost some of their stability. So please factor that in if you're doing fall reduction training with your clients and you notice they have a Morton's toe with a callus under the second and the toe is floating up, they just lost some of their connection. Okay, so when you have that, you see a callus under the second, you're looking at the toe, you're asking them, well, how are they fitting their shoes? Do I need to speak with them on how to properly fit their shoes to fit the second, not the first? It's important. Did they tear that plantar plate? The plantar plate remembers the ligament. And as soon as you tear that ligament, your toe floats up. So as soon as that toe floats up, again, remember, you're going to lose your contact. So how you can start to address this is that if you have a long second digit, you want to make sure you properly fit your shoes. Work with your clients to find appropriately fitted shoes. You want to actually tape the toe down. You can tape that toe down and stabilize. Okay, you can use a U pad, so a padding to offload that second, or you could use what's called a metatarsal pad on the bottom of the foot and you lift the foot up and you open it up. If you don't wanna do that, you can also go to rocker base shoes. You can tell that I'm a fan of rocker base shoes. Um, it doesn't have to be sketch or shape ups. There are other rocker base shoes. Hoka is a better one. Um, technically, there's a lot of cushion in a Hoka, which I don't like. But if you put the Naboso insoles into the Hoka shoe, you bring the sensory into an environment that has decreased sensory stimulation from the cushion. So if you definitely put any of your clients that have, you know, they're a little bit older, maybe a little bit less connected to their feet, and you put them in a rocker based Hoka so they can move through a gait pattern, you got to tie in the Naboso insoles, okay? All right, here's another one that we see, and this is actually really common with the aging population because of different neuropathies and how they affect the foot. So this is a tripod foot. So let's say you look at the bottom of your client's feet and they have callus under the first, callus under the fifth, and then they got a hot spot under the heel. Boom, they are very tripoded a tripod foot. So think high arch. You can look at, look at how high these arches are. I hope you can appreciate that. High arch foot, tripod calluses, rigid, rigid, rigid foot. Okay. It's, it may be very painful for them to be barefoot on a hard surface because of the rigidity of that foot. So you want to start thinking, I need to mobilize this foot. I need to get this foot to relax, relax the intrinsics in the bottom of the foot, relax the extrinsics of the lower leg and get this foot to relax. I hope that you can appreciate the hammer toes, the contractures of the digits on here as well. Totally goes hand in hand, right? Higher arch feet typically start to get the toes contracting and lifting up. So that means they potentially lost purchase in their toes. We don't want to be balancing on a tripod with our toes not contacting the ground. That's greatly going to contribute to a fall risk. Okay, so that tripod high arch, you often are also going to see this with limited ankle dorsiflexion. So if you see limited ankle dorsiflexion in a tripod foot with high arches and contracted digits, those all go together. And in your mind, that should mean rigid, rigid, rigid. I need to get this foot. So the next callus that you may see is, it's called diffuse. So that means that you have calluses across the entire ball of the foot. Now, when you see calluses across the entire ball of the foot, 
This means that that foot is actually in a plantar flexed position. So imagine that you were in like high heels, right? Or you had a little bit of a drop, okay? As soon as you shift into a plantar flex position to the front of your foot, you put all of your body weight across those metatarsal heads. That can cause diffuse callus across the ball of the foot. And when you see that, tell yourself limited ankle dorsiflexion. They've got increased pressure to the front of the foot that can be very painful. Oftentimes you'll also see hammer toes, contractures across the front of the foot as well. And that puts retrograde pressure to the ball of the foot. So when I see diffuse calluses, I want to open up those digits. I want to mobilize the bottom of the foot and I need to mobilize that ankle to get them more centered on their foot versus boop, pushing forward to the ball of the foot. Okay. So this is typically the foot type that you will see a lot of pressure to the ball of the foot, hammer toes and calluses across the ball of the foot. This is cavus means high arch an anterior cavus foot. If you look at this, do you see that it kind of looks like this foot is in a high heel? Can you kind of appreciate that? Like the front of the foot is sitting lower than the back of the heel. This is a classic foot type that I see all the time. I see it all the time when I do workshops and in professionals and trainers and coaches. And this foot type is equal to increased pressure on the ball of the foot. They are in essentially a plantar flexed position. Plantar flex position means limited ankle dorsiflexion. So if you have this foot type in a client and you're watching them squat, let's say, and they keep compensating for limited ankle dorsiflexion, you shouldn't be surprised because the driver is their foot type. Okay. So what we want to be doing is mobilize, mobilize, mobilize. They have hammer toes as well. You can appreciate that. Use the correct toes and the toe spacers. Maybe use a metatarsal pad to open up the front of the foot and try to find some balance in this otherwise very rigid And also remember that when people have rigid feet and ankles, their hips are almost always rigid as well. So you can start to make that association when you're looking at your clients. Okay. Now, one thing that I do want to mention here is something we want to ask ourselves is, do they have an underlying neurological condition? So there is something that is called a neurological cavus foot. So remember that uh, cavus means high arch. And when people start to get various neurological conditions. A stroke is probably one of the most common that you'll see this in. Um, but Charcot-Marie Tooth, if you're familiar with that, that's a sensory motor neuropathy, but you could see it in other neuropathies that have persisted for many years, is that the whole foot kind of pulls in like this. And they get this really, really, really high arch with hammer toes, and it's really rigid and stuck. That is a direct uh, response or result to the neurological disconnect to the motor function of the foot, okay? So they're losing some of the strength of the intrinsics and they're losing some strength of how the extrinsics or the lower leg muscles balance out the foot. So someone with a stroke, if you see on one side, a really, really high arch foot, don't be surprised. It's a result of the stroke and that, that muscle imbalance, okay? Focus on mobilization, bring sensory stimulation to the foot, use the toe spacers, try to get some soft tissue release. That's what we would want to focus on. Okay. You also want to ask yourselves is, do they maybe have to stand long hours, right? What is the pressure that they're putting on their feet? If you have a tripod foot, a high arch foot that is very rigid, it is so painful to stand long hours. So you need to help them understand to mobilize their feet. Maybe when they stand long hours, they need to use a different type of shoe that accommodates and shifts pressure away from these hot spots. 
that is something that I want you to, to think about is that calluses are hot spots. Where the callus is on the foot, the story of where the callus is on the foot is for you to understand and then know that that hot spot is because of a foot structure, a foot imbalance, and then it's going to affect everything higher up. So orthotics are an option here. You can offload these hot spots, definitely mobilize, and then bring in different paddings as well. Okay, so that's going to be the story. Sorry, that's going to be the story of the calluses. Now, the next story that we want to look at is when someone has a black toenail, right? Totally know hands down what this means, right? So your client comes in, they're a runner, and they keep getting a black second toenail. Oh, my goodness, right? What is that from? I refer to this as runner's toe. And it is often seen when someone has a Morton's toe. And if you fit the shoe to the first, not the second, and someone is running and moving or playing um, pickleball or tennis or something like that, and there's a lot of stop and go, you're essentially jamming into the shoe, creating essentially trauma to that second nail. So as soon as you see uh, a blackened, a darkened, blood under the second nail. That's what it is, it's blood under the second nail. You wanna say, do they have a Morton stone? Boom, they do, guess what? Are they fitting their shoes to the first? Most likely, yes. Have they been running or doing something kind of stop and go? So there's jamming into the front of the shoe. Yes, they play pickleball every Saturday, I don't know, right? So what are we gonna do? How can we help this client so that they're moving more efficiently and not doing that to their foot? Uh, one thing that I will add real quick is that oftentimes when you see a black toenail on the second, how I typically see it is I'll see a black toenail on the second, a Morton's toe, a hammer toe in the second, and then a callus under the second. They all go together like one big family, okay? So we want to be addressing them very similarly as well. So toe spacers, get that toe a little bit straight, get the shoes properly fitted. If they have a callus under the second, you want to use some sort of padding to offload it. And then one thing that's really important is if you get properly fitted shoes, you want to make sure that you change the lacing so that their foot doesn't slide forward continuously. And all sneakers have an additional eyelet that is sitting higher up and the, the manufacturers don't lace shoes all the way into that eyelet. But if you look at, at your client's sneaker, there's one additional eyelet that if you lace it in there and you tie the shoe a little bit higher up the foot, it'll prevent that foot from sliding forward. Another great secret that I'll use with patients is you can get what's called lamb's wool. And the lamb's wool is something that dancers will use and they put it in their point shoes in the tips of the point shoes and it will kind of soften the the jamming that's happening in the shoe you have this lambs wool in the front and it's going to be a little bit softer for that client okay that's also really good for the older client because the skin is thinner in an older client so if you have thin skin, the sensitivity of the skin is higher. Um, the Under the corns, I believe I will mention it, but something also that you can see is that when you get hammer toes, you're going to get a callus on the tips of the toes. So if you ever get a callus on the tip of the toe from sitting like this, that's also something you wanna be really mindful of, okay? Now, corns, Woo, we are in our little dermatological class today, right? I am turning you all into dermatologists. Okay, so corns are different than a callus, okay? Uh, callus is diffuse pressure. First met head, fifth met head, second met, pinched callus, right? Diffuse pressure. Corns are pinpoint pressure, so slightly different. The corn that you typically get on the tops of the toes is because of the precise pinpoint pressure from oftentimes shoes, 
Okay. So when you have someone with corns on the knuckle of their toes, right? It's obviously telling you that they have hammer toes, right? They have toe contractures. When someone gets toe contractures, not only does it potentially change their toe purchase, throwing off their balance, but it can also cause other imbalances higher in the body. So there are two main types of hammer toes, and these will definitely tie back to function. You have hammer toes, contractures, that can happen in the flexor phase, and you have contractures that happen in the extensor phase. So we have extensors and flexors, right? We extend, we flex, same thing, same thing. That's all I'm referencing, okay? Your flexors of your foot are on the bottom of the foot, right? They insert on the bottom tip of your toe. So if you are engaging your flexors and you get hammer toes, okay, that is a flexor dominant hammer toe. Makes sense, okay? How you can see this in your clients is if you tell them to do short foot, and as soon as they do short foot, their toes contract. They get hammer toes when they do short foot, okay? Another way that you can see it and that I love to assess it I have my clients stand and they do a heel raise, a calf raise. And every time they do a calf raise, they get boom, contracture of the digits. So that is a great screen for you to see these flexor dominant contractures. Now, what that means is that the long flexors are overpowering your small intrinsic. This is a muscle imbalance. So the intrinsics of the foot are being over dominated by the large flexors of the foot. Okay. Now that means that every single step that your client takes when they go into that push off position, they get a contracture of their hammer toes. This is important because if you have a client that you look at their feet open chain and they say, I don't have hammer toes. Why do I have corns on my knuckles? That you do have hammer toes. They're dynamic hammer toes. They're not stuck rigid where you're sitting there, but every time you move, you get a hammer toe, okay? The extensor ones are going to be when the extensors on the front of your ankle inserting on the tips of your toes, but the top of them, those engage when you squat. So if you squat and you see the toes lift off of the floor when your client squats, that's what this is, okay? Every time you squat and you're like, why are your toes lifting off of the floor? Stop lifting your toes off of the floor when you squat. One, they can't help it. Two, it is an extensor dominance, okay? The other way or phase that you will see this is every time they pick up their foot to take a step, their toes are gonna contract. So it's the extensor phase of walking, okay? Now, where and how and why the extensor dominant occur is oftentimes limited ankle dorsiflexion, limited ankle mobility, okay? And what happens is if I'm trying to squat and I don't have enough dorsiflexion in my ankle, my muscles are saying, okay, I need to pull your tibia forward as much as I can, right? Because when we squat, dorsiflexion of your ankle is your tibia coming forward, right? This is me dorsiflexing my ankle when I'm doing a squat. You can look at yourself doing a squat too, right? Your tibia comes forward. So if you have a limited ankle dorsiflexion, your muscles say, pull tibia forward farther, harder, right? And it starts to pull with your extensor muscles and your extensors lift. Okay, so both of these, both of these dynamic, you wanna understand the cause. Is it flexor, is it extensor? If it's flexor, mobilize the flexors. If it is extensor, mobilize the extensors. Then you want to get some correct toes, toe spacers, right? I don't care what brand you use. And then you want to strengthen the intrinsic muscles, intrinsic muscles. If it is an extensor dominant hammer toe, you need to mobilize that ankle. 
you really want to ask yourself, what is the cause of their limited ankle dorsiflexion, right? I have a whole webinar I did on limited ankle dorsiflexion. Is it soft tissue? Is it osseous? Did the talus shift forward? Is it spasticity, right? What is causing that limited ankle dorsiflexion so that they can stop engaging the extensors and getting these hammer toes dynamically, okay? So that's the way that we want to kind of be thinking about this. Now, outside of the uh, calluses and corns, you have another common uh, soft tissue irritation that can occur, and this is going to be blisters, okay? Now, blisters are from friction. So that means that as that client is moving, as they're pushing off, whatever movement pattern phase they're in, there's something that is causing friction. There's rotation of the foot somehow. And I often see that this is during the push-off phase. So when people have limited first MPJ dorsiflexion, okay, limited dorsiflexion in the big toe, when they go to push off and take a step, they don't have enough range of motion in the big toe, so they turn their feet out, they spin. I actually call it a cigarette twist. So that means that every time they take a step, they actually twist the foot like this. That's friction, right? So when I see a client or a patient that has a blister under the first met head or a blister under the big toe, I know for sure how they're walking. I don't even need to watch them walk, okay? They're doing this cigarette twist, this spin out as they go into their push off phase of gait. Okay, so that means we need to then understand and go back to what are the causes of limited first MPJ dorsiflexion, right? Is it because they have a bunion? Is it because they have arthritis? And then we want to go to the other solutions of what we went over. Okay, now real quick with the blisters, if you do have this, as a bonus with the blister is that if you have this on in your clients, you want to make sure that you drain them, but do not de-roof them. So this is the roof, roof of the blister, and you do not ever wanna take that skin off. So you just wanna drain the fluid that's in it and then keep that top skin on top. And then you just dry it out and boom, you'll be good to go in a couple of days, okay? But you have a client who has blisters. Maybe they have diffuse blisters across the ball of the foot um, that is just telling you that really how they're spinning is, um, it, it is quite intense as far as the rate at which they're doing it. So you see someone with blisters, you don't wanna just be like, hmm, maybe your shoes are rubbing, right? We wanna actually think about the movement pattern. So here, do they have a cigarette twist? That's the spinning of the foot at a push off. Do they have limited first MPJ dorsiflexion? Okay, that would cause a compensation such as the cigarette twist and they're shifting into a low gear push off. Or here's one that is always something to think about. Are the feet sweating excessively? If it is, technically, that is telling you a story as well, right? Uh, when we sweat, it's just going to create more friction. So you just want to address that as well, okay? Now, I want to just share with you briefly a story that I had with one of my patients who, she was a runner, and she was a treadmill runner. So she ran um, at the gym with a treadmill. And she came into me after seeing a couple other podiatrists and she's like, no one can figure out why, why I'm getting these, you know, crazy blisters every time I run. And she came in one day after, um, going from a run the day before, and she had like massive blisters on the side of the big toe, under the big toe, on the medial side of the foot, like large blisters that also had blood in them. And she was saying, like, I would, I go to the running shoe store and say, there's something with this shoe. And they're saying, I, I don't know. Right. So, oh my God, that's intense blisters. Like, okay, I'll exchange your shoes. No problem here. She would go running again, get the exact same blisters and then go back to the running shoe store. And they, they didn't know. And they're like, okay, try those shoes. And this chick tried like probably five pairs of different shoes in the running shoe store would let her just exchange them and get another pair and exchange and get another pair because they had no idea why she was getting such severe blisters. 
went to several podiatrists, same thing. They would just drain it and be like, I think it's the shoes. You have to change your shoes. Okay. So she comes to me and I'm like, this doesn't sound right. Right. And I was like, I need to watch you run because you're doing something. There's something in your move. Okay. There's something in your movement that is causing the blisters. So I have a treadmill in my office and I said, okay, I'm going to watch you run. So I took her to the treadmill and she, she ran and I'm watching her run. And I'm like, okay, I'm not really seeing that much. And I was like, well, is this, is this how you run? Right? Like if you're being assessed, you're going to run a certain way. And I said, "I, I want you to run exactly how you're running at the gym. And she goes, okay, well, what I do is I, incline the treadmill and I turn it to like an eight, eight mile an hour, so quite fast, right? So she's increasing the incline, cranking up the speed. And then she goes, I hang on the monitor of the TV and I essentially sprint. And I'm watching this, this girl running and sprinting. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that is exactly where your blisters are coming from because the belt is moving so fast that is by the time your foot touches the ground, it is spinning out and you're getting these blisters. So I had to convince her (laughs) to not hang on to the TV monitor and to slow down and actually run in a way that is carrying her weight. Really, she should be running on, if it's a treadmill, a non-motorized treadmill so she can actually understand the mechanics. Of course, she does this and all of her blisters stop coming back, but it's just a really good example of instead of just looking at kind of the the initial easiest thing to blame and associate, like must be your shoes running, rubbing, right, is to actually look at the movement pattern and see if there's something in that movement pattern that is matching what we're seeing in these calluses and these corns and these blisters, Okay. So what we want to do if we are seeing blisters in our clients is you really want to look at that that range of motion. If they're they're on the big toe, you're looking at what's happening with the first MPJ. Why are they spinning that push off, right? Is it something that we can address in that first MPJ, okay? If it's something in a bunion, we mentioned already some ways to address a bunion. If it's excessive sweating, technically this goes back to a dermatological reason, but there's different powders. You can soak your feet in tea. You can do Botox. So there's other things that can kind of regulate um, the excessive sweating. And if it is in fact the shoe, which is part of the story, maybe it's not the shoe, but it's the lacing of the shoe. So try to look at every aspect of what is influencing these movement patterns to see if we can uh, be detectives and pull some of that information out of this, okay? Well, my microphone is back. I want to uh, summarize and then open it up to some questions to see if you guys have any additional stories that you're seeing in your client's feet that you've always wondered about. So I just want to kind of pull back for a moment and, and summarize on this, that when you're looking at your client's feet, right? We, we don't want to just look at the feet from a mechanical perspective and say that they have high arches and they have flat feet or they have uh, limited ankle dorsiflexion, but there's more to the foot that is telling you what's going on in their movement pattern. There's more to the story that's telling you where their pressure distribution is, right? If you look at the foot and you see calluses on the front of the foot and you, you see a higher arch foot, technically you don't even need to assess the ankle joint dorsiflexion because you know that it's a limited Okay. If you see a pinched callus and maybe they have ingrown toenails on the inside of the nail, you know that they're pushing off with a low gear push off. What does that do up the rest of the chain? And how do you address that low gear push off? Okay. If they have a contracted second, a long second toe, they have hammered uh, uh, blood underneath the second digit. Again, it's telling you these things, right? Look at the shoes, look at the movement pattern. Okay. Um, as you are thinking of any questions that you may have, I'm gonna just gonna briefly tell you another story as far as um, two times in my career of training people about how to assess the feet 
is probably I've trained maybe 25,000 people. I, I now I can't keep track anymore. But through through conferences and and seminars I've done and virtual just literally everything that I've done uh, in my education career and there's two women that I remember training when I was in Australia this one time and both of them were blind and it was really really cool to teach them and I was teaching them this stuff that I was saying you know your eyes are shut you're blind right so you have to use tactile touch and they would palpate the foot and feel these different calluses and corns and different kind of story that the foot was telling from a tactile perspective and they could extrapolate just as much as the person that could actually see and I taught them also how to do a gait assessment through auditory so they would listen to the different phases of gait on a treadmill it was super cool and they were actually some of the uh, most astute like they could actually pick up things that when others were too reliant to kind of cognitive and stuck in their head, looking for visual things to jump out at them. Um, the, the two women that were blind actually had a, a more accurate perception of the movement of that client, which is super cool. I love that story. Um, so last thing I'm gonna mention real quick is about Naboso. Naboso is a sponsor for the Functional Aging Summit. Uh, all of our products are two-point discrimination. They are sensory-based. We have insoles, mats, flooring, um, our release ball, our neuro ball, and we have several new products that are coming out this year. So if you have not tried them yet, we work with a lot of professionals such as you as wholesalers, resellers, you can get them up to 50% off. If you want to resell them to your clients, we have an affiliate program that gives you 10% earnings and a discount for your, for your clients. But it's a super easy integrated approach to optimize the connection to the feet to improve balance, posture, and gait. Um, so please do check out Naboso. And I thought I had one more slide about my education, but please check out ebfaglobal.com to learn more about uh, my education that I offer and um, some of our courses that we do live and online. So I will answer any questions that you have, Lindsay, if you want to moderate those. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know if anybody else finds themselves every session I sit in with you. I sit, find myself like looking at my feet, palpating my feet and then thinking of what, so I, I'm guessing I wasn't the only one. <laughs> Another amazing, amazing session. Thank you. So some great questions have come in. Angela wants to know, can bunions be corrected by exercise? Okay, so bunions similar to the size that I had shown or the that image in that x ray, they are actually a structural imbalance in the foot anything that is structural unfortunately doesn't fall under something that can be corrected from exercise. However, I often say that you can pause a bunion so if you catch it early enough and you can pause it in its uh, most mild phase that is what you want. So it's better to be preactive versus reactive in medicine. Um, and bunions are an example of that. Once they get too far deviated, then it becomes a little bit different animal. And the, the big thing with bunions is that you are actually deviating off of your cartilage. So the arthritis effect of bunions is, in my opinion, the most impacting side of it. Um, so unfortunately, no but you can try to center the, the first MPJ a little bit more through toe spacers. You still wanna strengthen the intrinsics and think of it more as pushing pause versus reversing. I like that perspective of, of pause. That's important. Um, Rebecca wants to know on the high heel foot with the middle callus, I think that image that you had shown that looks like high heel is what she's referring to. What is the white hole or dot off to the side? Is that also a callus? Uh, let me go back to that. Here? I think it might be the one that looks like a high heel with the, high, uh, yes, I think this is the one is, let's see. Um, Rebecca, are you on that you might jump in either by audio or, and or video? Yes, uh, this is Kirsty actually, and I'm with Rebecca and Avery. We're from Saskatoon, and uh, it's actually the one before this. This one. one. This one, yes. The white. There's like, do you see that white dot to the left, right, right there? 
Yeah. Is that oh, also? Yes. Guess what? You get another dermatological <laughs> lesson. So yeah. that is called, you guys are going to be like, oh my God, this is derm, derm 101 today. Um, so that is called an IPK. It's actually a corn and it's a corn that grows into the foot. These are so painful for patients or for, for clients. And it is a, remember corns are pinpoint pressure. So that means that there's a little condyle on the bone that is just creating a precise hot spot that's creating this corn versus the others are more calluses. So that's, that's a really good question. Um, that's technically a corn, it's not a wart. So many people go to the dermatologist and they think it's a wart, it's not, it's a corn. Good question, another good lesson. Um, Anne wants to know, what about bunions on the outside edge of the foot by the fifth toe to cause any mobility solutions? Yes, yeah, so that is called a Taylor's bunion. So a Taylor's bunion is on the outside of the foot that is not caused by any sort of muscle imbalances or biomechanical imbalances, very different than a traditional bunion. It is really based off of that person's unique anatomy and the fifth metatarsal shape. Uh, it can be a little bit more associated with shoes. And oftentimes it's actually more of a bursitis than the bunion that is what's irritating. So every um, kind of bony prominence in the body has a fluid filled sac that's called a bursa that sits there. And when you have tight shoes or people who sit in like a yogi pose, so they're um, cross-legged, uh, they put pressure on the fifth met head. Um, I've actually just saw a patient that did this when she was nursing her baby and she would sit kind of cross-legged and she put pressure on that fifth Sorry. And then she got a bursitis right from that. So it's, it's not in the same way as the traditional bunion, Taylor's bunion. Uh, great explanation. Uh, Patty wants to know, uh, she says, I walk regularly and have recently been having hip pain after my walk on my left side. Is that due to her feet, a foot, uh, you know, something there she's talking about? Yeah. So without seeing her walk and doing like a larger evaluation. Let's say that was your client and, the, and they're saying this. I just want you to start the conversation in your head to be, okay, she's complaining about hip pain when she walks. Let's think about the phases of gait and stride length and, and how you swing the leg forward. And then just say, okay, what, it, what are the ranges of motion that we need in the foot and the ankle? Obviously you need ankle dorsiflexion and you need uh, first MPJ dorsiflexion. So I would look at the foot and start to see what is the stability, what's the range of motion, what is the uh, strength of the foot, are they over pronating, is it high arched, are there hammer toes, right, are there bunions, and just start to look at the foot that way. So I don't have an exact answer right now, but that's the question that I would ask, and if I saw her as a patient, that's what I would do, is I would assess the foot in all of those different ways, I think the big takeaway from that question is, is just because someone has hip symptoms doesn't mean the hip is the problem. It could be in the foot as well. I'm gonna piggyback on that and kind of go off script. And there's a couple more questions here, but I think where, whether it's personal or with your client, when it, you know, as a fitness professional, um, when it's beyond your scope, right? There's so much that you can look at and assess. Um, where would you suggest that that person goes, you know, go to see, right? Is it, is it an orthopod? Is it a podiatrist? Because maybe they're not getting to the actual root of the issue. Is that something you might be able to give some guidance on? Yeah. So, so I like to look at, let's say you have a symptom of, uh, I'll do one that might be a little bit easier. So an adductor spasm, let's say like groin pain in an adductor spasm, but it could be any condition, um, is you have a choice to look at this either kind of zoomed in and say, this is the hip, this is the adductor. I need to go to a doctor that treats that condition. But then you could step back and pull away and say, what's happening in the global system of how this person is moving? That would be... Um, kind of an integrated functional approach. Now there's a benefit to both of them and there's an appropriateness to both of them. Let's say that this client with the adductor
sorry, has a really bad tendonitis. And so we have a local pain trigger that maybe before we start addressing all of these movement patterns and the global issues that we see in the client, we need to first calm down this tendon that is just talking to the client. Okay. So that's where I would say, okay, get the tendon under control. Maybe it's an injection with a steroid. Maybe they need to do some imaging. So this is a very localized approach. Once that calms down, then we want to pull back again and say, why did this happen in the first place? And then look at the movement pattern. However, if you have a local problem like an itis or in the foot, a, a really bad plantar fasciitis, and you just keep looking at the global movement pattern and you never first calm the tissue down locally, you're not gonna get any progress. So that's, that's how I start to guide people is say, there's a time and place for a referral to an integrated movement specialist. Maybe that's a chiropractor, a physical therapist, or you yourself do it, which is awesome that, but then there's the more specialized imaging injections, something right where it would be a podiatrist or an orthopedist or a sports medicine doctor, and you get that, and then you have to pull back again. Um, so that's kind of how I would start to answer that question to guide. Yeah, you. it's definitely not a straight and that's great. Uh, the way that you look, take approach to that. Um, Angela wants to know if you could just uh, quickly recap how to uh, take down the Morton's toe you, you started talking about and yes. then double with what does a bunion booty do? Yeah. So the taping of the toe. So let's say my toe is floating and I put tape. Hmm, I have a YouTube video on this. <laughs> Don't have my tape, but you're essentially uh, it's called basket weaving uh, to tape the toe down. So it stays on the ground. Um, if you email me, I'll send you the video. <laughs> which I I'm just do. looking it up. Maybe I can pop it in the thing. Yeah, it's, it's on my yeah. EBFA YouTube channel. I'll look I'm it up. Yeah. Keep it down. Um, but you're essentially basket weaving with tape to pull the toe down. Um, please, please message me if, if uh, we don't find the, the video, Lindsay's aggressively trying to find it. Um, and then the bunion booty is like a little sock that goes over the big toe and hooks around the ankle and it pulls the toe out to the side. So it's addressing the deviation of just the first digit where toe spacers and correct toes creates alignment of all So yeah, so there's a time and place for a bunion booty, but also the toe spacers. Okay, um, we have a couple minutes here, and I think you're staying on for an hour for more Q and A. Which uh, are you? Is that right after this? I think. Um, I don't know. Oh, I think so. That's what the schedule says. I'll double check. But in the meantime, we've got a couple minutes. Um, is a ganglion cyst on the ankle caused from imbalanced biomechanics, and how to assess that? Okay, so a ganglion cyst, this is great. I'm sorry, I don't have an image of that. That's another dermatological thing. But a ganglion cyst, whether it's on the wrist, so sometimes people think of them on the wrist, but they can also be in the foot and the ankle as well. A ganglion cyst comes from joint trauma. Okay, so that's, that's the most important thing to understand. And that it is a extension or a leaking out of joint fluid into this space, which is the ganglion cyst, okay? Now, where what you want to think about if you see them is, do they have ankle arthritis? Was there ankle trauma? Do they have midfoot arthritis? Are they jamming into their midfoot? So is there something mechanical that is causing this? And 100%, there's almost always a mechanical association to ganglion cysts. Um, in the wrist, you get them from like yoga. I've seen people get them in yoga or doing planks and down dogs, and they have insufficient wrist stability. So they kind of collapse into the wrist and they jam the bones of the wrist here and then they can get a ganglion cyst here or they're carrying really heavy things and they're not engaging in their fascial system really well and they pull on the joints and then they get ganglion cysts that way as well um, so that's a really good question and it is something that also is telling a story about 
the potential stability uh, and range of motion of that foot. Um, one more quick one here. I don't know how quick this could be, but why is plantar fasciitis so hard to rehab? Um, okay. What I would say to that one is when you get someone with plantar fasciitis is you want to, in the way that my mind thinks is that I want to differentiate it between acute and chronic. So if someone comes in and says, oh, I have plantar fasciitis or I have heel pain, whatever, right away, I need to know how long they've had it for, right? If someone has had it for two weeks or two years, those are completely different animals and they need to be addressed completely. Sorry. So they're, they're completely different animals. The one where you have it for longer period, you actually get degeneration of the fascia itself. It is kind of this stasis it's stuck in the healing process and it doesn't respond to releasing the feet strengthening the feet mobilizing the ankle the same way that an acute plantar fasciitis would so if you are finding that you have a little protocol that you do for your clients that have heel pain and in some of them it's not working and you don't understand why that's what i would say to start with is to differentiate them based off of type of plantar fasciitis I think we have covered most everything. I did get one uh, a private question, but I think that, that he's going to stay on um, for your Q&A. Um, if there's any other questions or um, anything that you guys uh, last in this last moment, minute, quick questions. Um, these were This was a great Q&A session. And I do believe if you're able, to, I think it's in this room, Dr. Emily, um, if you'll hang tight, but you can probably end the recording and we'll start up again. Everyone, thank you for joining. Thank you, Dr. Emily, for sharing your brilliance once again. This was a fantastic